Thanks so much for thanks so much for the intro, Boris, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, yeah, so Nit, um, Willa Lilina, hello, how are you? Um, I, I am indeed a citizen of the Niska Nation, and I'm actually currently in Gitlak Damix in the nation, so just at the base of the Alaska Panhandle. And so sometimes my internet is a bit spotty, which is why I was keeping my video off. So I might actually turn it off just in favor of it not cutting out and, and me dropping. Um, but please do chime in, interrupt me if, if you do lose my audio at any point, but it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so I'd like to begin by sincerely thanking you all uh, for your interest and enthusiasm in me and in my areas of research. And I'm, I'm just delighted to be here on behalf of the Center for Indigenous Fisheries at UBC to present on centering indigenous fisheries in 4R research, teaching and outreach. And I've tried to keep this talk under the 45 minute mark. So hopefully that leaves some time for discussion on the other side of this. And before diving in, I'd like to first acknowledge that I'll use words from Niska and other languages in this talk to highlight the power of Indigenous languages to lend insight in conversations of this nature, but not to give the impression of any degree of fluency on my part. I am a learner now and always. I grew up far outside my territory, so I'm, I'm just baby steps moving in this direction. Um, but it's a gift and a responsibility that I have as a Niska citizen to give life to the knowledge that, that's been shared with me and my elders tell me to, to practice and to use the language. So I follow their instruction here where I can. I wanna start us off today by unpacking and, and maybe introducing you to indigenous research methodologies and this 4R concept that I reference in my title. Sean Wilson, author of Research is Ceremony, asserts that indigenous research methodology means talking about relational accountability. As a researcher, you're answering to all your relations when you are doing uh, research. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, author of Decolonizing Methodologies, is concerned not so much with the actual technique of selecting a method, but much more with the context in which research problems are conceptualized and designed and with the implications of research for its participants and their communities. Employing indigenous research methodologies for me has not so much changed the approaches by which I do science, but rather the ethics I apply to that science. It's not so much about altering the scientific method per se, although it can be, but often it's about the value system under which that method is applied. And as put forward in decolonizing methodologies, the super critical questions to be asking are centered around whose research is it, who owns it, whose interests does it serve, who will benefit from it, who's designed the questions and framed its scope, who will carry it out, who will write it up, how will results and benefits be shared. In Sheila Jasonoff's 2007 Nature paper on the technologies of humility, she asks us to think harder about how to reframe problems so that their ethical dimensions are brought to light. And she recognizes the huge value of the standard scientific approach and gives the example that climate scientists can tell us with high certainty that human activities are raising Earth's mean surface temperature, that extreme weather events will occur, and that melting ice caps will cause abrupt changes in the global climate. We know that, but she continues by clarifying how science cannot tell us where and when disaster will strike, how to allocate resources between prevention and mitigation, which activities to target first in reducing greenhouse gases, or whom to hold responsible for protecting the poor. She uh, issues within this a call for humility especially for policy and decision makers to recognize the limits and the very real partiality of scientific knowledge, especially when faced with issues of extreme urgency and high uncertainty. And in her view, policies and decisions based on humility might redress inequality before finding out how the poor are hurt by climate change, value greenhouse gases differently depending on the nature of the activities that give rise to them, and uncover the sources of vulnerability in fishing communities before installing expensive tsunami detection systems as, as a few examples. 
And while her call to action is, is not on the subject of indigenous research methodologies really at all, her plea to re-engage with the moral foundations of science, this aligns extremely well in my view. The 4R concept that I reference in my title was first described by Verna Kirkness and Ray Barnhart in 1991 as respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility with respect meaning valuing and building on the diverse knowledges of the individual, the culture, the community. Relevance referring to involving the community in all stages of the project to make sure research is relevant to the needs and dreams of community and culture. Reciprocity refers to when researcher and community both benefit from the project and learning and research is a two-way process. This is positioned specifically to counter the, the vast multitude of one-sided projects that are simply aimed at achieving academic milestones, often ignoring the goals and concerns of indigenous research partners. And finally, we have responsibility, which is an overarching concept tied to the previous three Rs, where the researcher is mindful of all perspectives and accountable to all partners in the research process. And this culminates in research that is pluralistic and holistic where multiple knowledge systems are respected and considered valid, often brought together through interdisciplinary practices reflecting the interconnectedness of everything in our world, in research that is applied, addressing key localized or contextualized concerns and answers to specific identified problems, in research that is participatory and mutually beneficial with gains from the research being shared among all project partners and that is steeped in this idea of relational accountability of holding ourselves responsible to all our relations and all our partners in the research process. So my plan uh, for today is to walk you through a number of my past, present and future research teaching and outreach endeavors to share with you some of my preferred practices uh, to highlight really important missteps, which uh, Stalo scholar Joanne Archibald cleverly calls oh no moments instead of aha moments and speak to the ambitions and vision that I have for the Center for Indigenous Fisheries, which keeps me accountable and on a mission that serves all our relations with a special interest in protecting the ever important interrelationships between fish, people, and place. So I'll start with my most recent and major set of research projects. And that's what I did for my, my PhD that Boris referenced entitled Fish, People, Place, Interweaving Knowledges to Elucidate Pacific Salmon Fate. And this used the life cycle of salmon and the linked cycle of salmon-based knowledge systems as a conceptual framework that guided how I approached various assessments of the state of freshwater systems, the state of salmon systems, as well as related knowledge systems, the effects of multiple stressors on salmon migrations. And perhaps in Scott Hinch's recent talk, you, you heard uh, similar themes come up there as well as the transformative power of Vetoeptima or two-eyed seeing that emerges from the territory as many of you are, are currently within in Mi'kmaq, which I apply to fisheries research and management. This was a hugely interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary dissertation bringing together fish biotelemetry, so tagging and tracking, interviews with knowledge keepers, as well as a ton of synthesis and review. So my, my first and my fifth chapters, they brought together experts to assess threats to freshwaters and threats to salmon systems respectively. They also sought to look at changes in freshwater biodiversity and access to salmon respectively, and both identified a laundry list of key concerns with a ton in common, things like climate change and infectious diseases, and I, I won't get into the specifics here, but in super simplified terms, this work also found pronounced changes over the last 50 years, with both studies revealing that global freshwater biota in chapter one, shown in the blue line, and salmon access, uh, shown in the gold line, for indigenous communities in BC, which was focused on in the fifth chapter, 
they both on average declined to one sixth of what they were approximately five decades ago, which is a startling figure to consider and, and interesting that we can take very different approaches, tap into really different knowledge bases and databases and, and arrive at very similar values. My first chapter was published open access uh, in biological reviews and the final chapter is being included in an upcoming exciting special issue in facets uh, with my piece entitled learning from indigenous knowledge holders on the state and future of wild Pacific salmon so stay tuned for that. And it's some of those key concerns that were identified in, in those first and fifth chapters that I was able to focus on in my biotelemetry work in my third and fourth chapters to see how fisheries interactions, changing temperatures and other stressors affect the ability of sockeye salmon to reach their spawning grounds. And this involved working across British Columbia's three most salmon bearing systems, the Fraser, the Skeena and the Nass rivers with the Nass being home of the Niska where I am now. And in very broad strokes, what I found here working in collaboration with indigenous fishers was that fish injury being female and contending with high water temperatures tends to reduce the likelihood of salmon successfully completing their migration after they've been intercepted in a fishery. I was looking at the post-release fate of first sockeye salmon bycatch on the north coast of BC, where in the year of this work in 2016, according to numbers from DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, over 46,000 sockeye were released as bycatch from marine commercial persane vessels like you see here in the specific area in which I was working with fewer than 500 sockeye allowed to be retained as harvest in this season. So there's clearly a pretty big mismatch between retention and release. The second thing I was studying was how sockeye salmon fare after they escape from in-river gillnet fisheries in the Fraser, where between 10 and 40% of sockeye arrive on spawning grounds with net marks consistent with having struggled free from a gillnet, but until this work and related work by, by some of my colleagues and lab mates, we didn't have a good understanding of how much this escape experience might be contributing to mortality on their way to spawning grounds, what we call en route mortality. So they're basically just not showing up and being reflected in those, uh, in those values of 10 to 40% arriving on spawning grounds with those net marks. In both cases, this was experimental fisheries work where we were working in stream with fishers using their gears, practices, crews, and knowledges to mimic the fishery interaction as best as possible for the salmon. But we would intercept the fish to implant a radio tag before it continued along its migration path. And we did this for approximately 400 fish in both regions and used radio tracking methods to see who makes it to spawning grounds versus who doesn't and try to find out why. And big picture, we found that a quarter of North Coast bycatch didn't reach their spawning grounds, which roughly equates to six and a half thousand of those approximately uh, 26,000 bycatch salmon I mentioned dying en route. And we found that undergoing escape survival by an estimated 28% in the Fraser. And while these are concerning findings, they're also actionable and we can create really concrete fisheries management advice that might improve sockeye survival in the future, such as catching fewer fish at any one time so they're less crowded and then thereby less likely to be injured, and also to fish when water temperatures are below a certain concerning threshold, roughly around 19 degrees Celsius, which is what we're working on collating evidence around now. So those were my, my third and fourth chapters and the the last piece of the puzzle is a review as my second chapter on the state of knowledge systems and how they coexist and this concept of Weptimuk or two-eyed seeing that I previously referenced, which is embodied throughout the thesis, centering on how we can learn from the strengths of both indigenous ways of knowing and Western scientific knowledge for the benefit of all without assimilating one way of knowing into the other for it to be rendered valid. I led a review of how Etoweptima could be applied to fisheries research and management, which is published open access in fish and fisheries. And I also describe it 
in full in a virtual seminar that I delivered in 2020 to my now home department. And you can find that on YouTube if you search Andrea Reed to I'd Seeing. And the fundamental take home message of this work in my view is that the methods to enable pluralism are out there. And the more fundamental questions center on whether we as researchers or as managers are willing to relinquish some power, make some space in order for these processes to truly become equitable and just. My thesis was in short, pluralistic, applied, participatory, and highly relational. I wrote my entire 300 page <laughs> dissertation using the pronoun who for salmon in recognition of their very real role as relatives to live in reciprocity with, not simply resources to command and control like objects. And my work was entirely based on these relationships with the fish, with experts of all kinds, and especially with water and the various places that all of this work took me to. But it was not without its own no moments. There were extreme complications that arose from fish crossing territorial boundaries as inevitably anadromous salmon will. And this led to huge questions about who to work with, how and when. And I quickly learned that open data is, is not always the best policy when we're talking about culturally sensitive subjects like salmon, bringing us back around to those questions about who owns the data, who has the right to control it, access it, possess it. And from all of this, I learned how much work needs to be done on the front end of a project to establish and build trust, to build relationships so that the work can proceed in a good way. I learned how to not push a research agenda and, and how to listen to those willing to share their knowledge and insights with me. I also learned how to navigate the diversity of protocols that exist across community contexts, getting to uh, permission to work with knowledge keepers across 18 different communities in this province meant it could be as straightforward as just getting consent from interested individual elders in a community to participate, to requiring a presentation and proposal for approval by chief and council or hereditary leadership before going to those elders, to co-signing MOUs and laying out the specific terms of engagement in legalese before moving ahead with the work. I learned how much work of this nature means going beyond what makes it onto the page at the end of a study and how this can transform how the work gets done. And I'll pause here to share a quick example of something that really hit this home for me. When I was working in the Lake Babine Nation in the BC interior, there was one elder who was super standoffish and she'd come highly recommended as someone to speak with and she'd agreed to being interviewed. But when we sat down to talk, she gave really brief disengaged responses so I kept the interview short. I wanted to stop it in its tracks. I could tell that she didn't want to engage further. So I wanted to wrap things up as soon as possible. And as I was wrapping things up, she got a phone call about how she could come get fish from the river, that someone had fish ready for her. She just needed to come get them. And it was about a 20 minute drive down a forest service road from the community. And she had her little adorable granddaughter with her and didn't know how she could make all of this work. So I gladly offered to, to take her and her granddaughter there. And we had an awesome afternoon. We had fun chatting with fishers. We sorted through salmon and we spent the better part of the day by the river. And when I drove them home, she turned to me and said, do you want to do the interview again with a smile on her face? And like, she just knew that she could trust me, I guess, from, from that point where me dropping into a community where she didn't know my history or my connections, it takes time to instill that trust. And people have mistrust in university researchers for super good reasons. Trust is not a given and good intentions do not ensure good outcomes for all. The history of university research has been characterized by work on and not with indigenous peoples, on communities, on declared title land without permission or agreements, and certainly not with Indigenous partners and on their terms or with their consent. This is the history that we all have to reckon with if we expect different dynamics today. We have to work to earn trust and show through our work how we uphold those imbued responsibilities. I also importantly learned through this work how much 
some Western science practitioners can get nervous around talking about indigenous knowledge systems, whether that's because they're unsure of what language to use or fear of making a mistake. And these are totally valid ways to feel. But there are also many within the academy who don't see indigenous knowledge systems as valid or as scientific, who doubt their rigor or relevance. And for me, this is where I've found tremendous power in the idea of Etawaptima for transforming that particular perspective, that it's not about walking wholesale away from Western science. It's about recognizing with humility its limitations and welcoming knowledge and learning from other ways of knowing, from all kinds of evidence, from all kinds of science. And I've been told by members of my own community how much of a validating feeling this carries for fishers and knowledge keepers I work with that here I am as a PhD candidate at the time and I'm turning to them for answers that I treat with legitimacy. They in very real ways know so much more than me and more than I think I ever will about the salmon. One of, the, one of my closest mentors in my nation said at the time that she could see all of the, the elders and fishers beaming because I was asking them questions and bringing their knowledge into my work. And I was asked during my PhD uh, to begin running youth science camps in my nation. And it's a responsibility I've gladly taken up. And with support from multiple NSERC Indigenous Science Ambassador Awards and the Gingold Village Government's Education Department, I co-led either with my spouse, John Francis Lane, who's shown at the back of this image, uh, or with other research colleagues and friends, these multi-day camps that get youth into parts of the territory they might not otherwise have access to, that involves visiting fish wheels to learn about the salmon monitoring program that the Niska Fisheries and Wildlife Department has been running in the Nass River since the early 90s, chartering boats to visit nearby inlets and to whale watch or to see salmon migrating in land, doing biotelemetry scavenger hunts where youth learn how to use receivers and antennas to detect radio transmitters we've scattered throughout the village. And I'll tell you, they've learned these techniques far quicker <laughs> than myself. And it's through this kind of play that they're learning to use a technology that is employed by Niska fish in the salmon monitoring program. And we learn from and listen to elders, think about how language and story can inform our understanding and treatment of salmon. And this was a profoundly transformative set of experiences for me. And one part of what inspired me to get involved in launching this charitable organization, Riparia, with two friends and colleagues, Dr. Dalal Hanna and Michaela Wujek. This is an organization that connects female identifying and non-binary youth with learning opportunities on the water. And we offer free week-long canoe camping trips in Quebec at this time, we might expand in future, um, to both indigenous and non-indigenous youth. And we work with the New Frontiers School Board, who has among the highest indigenous represent representation across school boards in the city of Montreal. And we've recently accredited our programming with them so these youth can, can earn extra high school credit from what we hope is a pretty remarkable learning experience for them. And this is our team's way of giving back and being mentors to the next generation of water protectors, passing along the knowledge we've been given through our university studies, as well as time in community. And this gives youth a pretty rare opportunity, in our view, to learn directly from scientists and knowledge keepers in tandem about how we can respect and protect water through our choices, our actions, and our responsibilities within and beyond the program. What I've shared with you up to this point is really the culmination of work that has changed me as a researcher. I didn't go into this work with the understanding I have now of how I can use concepts like the four R's and, and similar ones like, like Edo Weptimak, even if, even if I knew it, I hadn't practiced it in this way to guide the direction, to guide the ambition of research. I more or less learned these for myself as I navigated this work in the best way I knew how. But now through this work that's opened my eyes to the wonderful scholarship being led by indigenous scholars from around the world, like Smith, like Wilson, and the others I referenced off the top of this talk, as well as from my time in community, I recognize how the purposeful application of these concepts can create 
far richer experiences for all and can help us avoid some of those oh no moments that can be great learning experiences for us as researchers to be sure, but perhaps ask a lot of our research partners and expose them to real risks that we should do our utmost to minimize. So I'll pivot here from, from looking backwards to, to now looking ahead to the work I'm undertaking with my team in the Center for Indigenous Fisheries that uses these, con these concepts as guideposts. Our logo uh, shown here was made for us by Klingit artist Rico Whirl, um, who accompanied this artwork with a statement that says, this design depicts the way that we observe the land and the land observes us back. It reminds us that the land relates back to us as we relate to it. And it depicts the cycles, the salmon egg and the arrival and departure of each new generation on that land. There's so much that he says within that, that to me ties into these same principles. The four R's have been applied super widely to social and health research, but I hope I can make clear for us today that they're just as relevant to research in the so-called natural sciences. I'll tell you first about this project that's a direct extension of my PhD research, and that is an investigation into how genomic signatures in those sockeye salmon I tagged up on the BC North Coast, how they vary over space and time. So using small samples taken from gill tissue of those live salmon that I tagged and released, we can run analyses that reveal the presence and load of salmon pathogens. And we can also look for the up and down regulation of different genes that have been linked to thermal stress, physical injury, various immune responses, and even death. These have been identified as priority understandings by elders and managers in my and other nations. For this work, we used those fish wheels that I previously mentioned, which are spread across various parts of the Nass River, home of the Niska, to recapture and resample these sockeye. So often capturing the same individual at two points along their migration, and sometimes even three, which is a really remarkable thing to think about to recapture the same wild salmon, often after having traveled hundreds of river kilometers. For each fish, me and my team took the first sample at sea, but before the tagged fish initiated upstream migration, and then NISCA fish technicians operating the wheels and other mon monitoring platforms in the system, like a weir and a fishway, they took secondary and sometimes tertiary gill samples for this work. And to be clear, none of this would have been possible without their buy-in contributions and efforts here. This gives us as a collective some really unique insight into which diseases are of concern where, how they change, how stress from fisheries capture or even fish wheel capture or rising temperatures might be affecting these fish. Doing this work on live salmon using non-lethal and minimally invasive techniques and using passive capture methods like fish wheels that have been long used by the NISCA. These are powered by the river current. These are all ways that we can minimize harm to fish and harm to water and show respect for the salmon and for the river. And I'm now working on wrapping up data analyses and, and write up with a wonderful research associate, Dr. Laura Elmer, to advance this work along with a number of other colleagues, and uh, we'll be sharing results with our partners in the Niska Nation and eventually producing a co-authored publication sharing these results more broadly. This work is positioned, as I said, to respect the fish river and our partners. It's answering to community identified needs. It is a reciprocal two-way process in which we're responsible to all our relations in this work. The next project I'll share jumps to Southern BC, where we're working with the First Nations Fisheries Legacy Fund, which includes six local nations in the Vancouver area, Katsi, Kwantlen, Coquitlam, Musqueam, Tawasin, and tsleil This group was inspired by some work by the Maori called the Cultural Health Index, which is a way of assessing freshwater health that includes Maori knowledge and values. The Legacy Fund nations wanted to bring this kind of thinking, this kind of framework to their context, to contextualize it to their knowledge, their values, and co-create a freshwater health index that relies on more than a Western science-based approach. Perhaps there are sites here in the Lower Fraser 
that maybe aren't unhealthy in the form of water contaminants or absence or low diversity of invertebrate or fish species, but perhaps they are unhealthy in that the community can no longer drink straight from the river or that access to culturally significant fisheries has been reduced. Maybe it's all of these things, maybe it's none of them, but surely we're gonna understand more about collective health by looking through both a biological and a cultural lens. So we've been invited uh, into this work with them and we've received support through the MyTax Accelerate Program and their indigenous call to support our first two master's students in the center, uh, Kate Musset, a settler scholar from Halifax originally, and Casey Sterling, who's Nlakatmuk, Mi'kmaq and Acadian. We've jointly led a series of community workshops that collectively identified sites and indicators of significance. And Kate and Casey are now refining a field and community protocol that involves their different kinds of sampling, such as water quality monitoring and aquatic insect metabarcoding, as well as information gathering through interviews and surveys to elucidate changes in water quality and quantity concerns from community perspectives. We aim in this work to develop a guide that will also serve other nations and communities who wish to implement the same kinds of methods in their contexts. The guiding principle of these communities in the region centers on traditional teachings with a central focus on sustainability and long-term planning across seven generations. This project values diverse knowledges from the outset. It's relevant to the partnering communities. They brought it to us. It is fundamentally a two-way process that aims to do much more than simply meet academic milestones. And it's guided by this ethic of responsibility to partners now and with seven generations in mind. Heading over to the coast in partnership with a group called the Ha'um Fisheries Society, a group representing five Nuchalnuk nations on the west coast of Vancouver Island, we have our first two uh, marine biology undergraduate honors students, uh, Nicole Jung, who is a descendant of Chinese immigrants, and Colton Vanderman from the Cleokuyat Nation. And both are undertaking research projects centered on Ha'um fish and fisheries interests. Nicole is working on a truly beautiful thesis entitled, What if Nuchalnuth Worldviews Informed Our Visions of Rockfish Stewardship? Assessing rockfish size and age trends in Nuchalnuth territories. And Colton is just about to undertake his field research uh, on Cleoquat Sound, uh, Chinook and Sockeye starting this summer. Ha'um and the hereditary chiefs of these nations, they have set a research agenda so that they're relevant to, to their needs. And through the efforts of these students, we're working diligently to meet our responsibilities, show respect towards all the knowledge systems we engage with through the work and reciprocally share all the benefits derived from the work undertaken. Now taking a leap out of BC for a minute and turning our focus over to the Great Lakes, of North America, where indigenous peoples have also lived for tens of thousands of years. Here we see the Great Lakes, uh, I guess, ostensibly shown on their side from a Western perspective, but this is the, the configuration for Anishinaabe and Ojibwe and Haudenosaunee peoples living throughout the region, that this was the conceptualization, the understanding of the layout of the Great Lakes. So here with uh, funding from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. We're initiating a project now centered on invasive sea lamprey and their control. In a project entitled Sea Lamprey Research and Management, Indigenous Input and Inclusion, we've nicknamed it the Three Eye Project. And we like this name because it's evocative of the two eyed seeing concept, but where we're focusing on more than bringing together ways of knowing, but really bringing in a third dimension, which is explicitly working together in a good way and defining collectively what this means in this context. The history of control methods for curbing the spread of sea lamprey, such as putting in barriers and applying potent chemicals, lampricides, it's been extremely one-sided and without the full participation and free prior and informed consent of nations and tribes throughout the Great Lakes. We endeavor to work with these communities to identify better pathways for working together on shared issues in future and envisioning more equitable governance in our fisheries management structures. 
we're also starting to think about really different conceptualizations around invasive species. Not everyone perceives invasives in the same way. And this is something that we're beginning to articulate with our partners in this work. And for this work, um, Alex Duncan from the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation is leading the way as the, the first PhD student in the center. And we're supported in this work by Dr. Elizabeth Nyboer, who is a current postdoc with us and an incoming assistant professor at, Virg at Virginia Tech. The last research project that I'll touch on today is one called Fish Outlaws. And this is funded by the National Geographic Society. And this is a collaboration grant that brings together my Myself as an Indigenous fisheries scientist, Amy Romer, a photographer and storyteller, Rena Priest, a writer from the Lummi tribe, and as of last year, Washington State's sixth poet laureate, as well as Lauren Eckert, a UVic PhD candidate who's a conservation scientist who applies social methods. Together and with support of a growing number of volunteers and students, we're working to bring to the fore stories of how Indigenous fisheries in the Salish Sea bioregion, so in and around the Vancouver area, have been criminalized, banned, usurped, or restricted out of existence. We are in the process of leading interviews with those who have lived these experiences and wish to share their stories more broadly, and we'll bring them together to envision what Indigenous fisheries justice in Canada and the United States could look like over efforts this coming fall, uh, this coming summer and fall. We're currently building a timeline of relevant legal proceedings, collecting, sharing, and visualizing stories and experiences. And from a research standpoint, beginning to understand the context in which indigenous fisheries have been targeted in these ways versus the context in which indigenous fisheries sovereignty has been upheld. The four R's are shaping all the decisions we make as we initiate this work and make it respectful, relevant, reciprocal, and responsible to all those that we're engaging in the process. And we hold the fishers of Sebeganegadi and elsewhere close in mind and heart as we move through this work and are likely considering expanding the geographic focus to, to also include experiences from the East Coast as well. The fact that many researchers feel ill-equipped to lead work of this nature, I think is a testament to how our education systems have failed us and continue to fail to appreciate indigenous knowledge systems and create better understandings of the colonial histories and the colonial present that bring us into this moment, as is kind of conveyed in this comic where a professor is questioning the merit of including indigenous ways of knowing on campus questions the presence of indigenous students in the student body, missing the fact that he's walking alongside an indigenous faculty member he mistakenly assumes is white. And this is a reality I regularly face. There's a huge opportunity here to do things better, to have more than say one research faculty member in UBC science who identifies as indigenous, to have even a single course in UBC science that explicitly focuses on indigenous sciences. These aren't critiques unique to UBC by any stretch as this is the reality across many, if not most campuses in this country and around the world. But it's not the, ca the case everywhere, of course, and we are seeing indigenous led programs and research labs and collaborations emerging that I believe will change our research practices, our expected standards, and even who scholars are moving forward. At UBC, I'm tackling this with a team of colleagues and we're working with groups in the Haida Nation to co-create a curriculum for a future course on co-creating aquatic science. We have support from UBC's Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund that has supported two years of engagement to date and started before my job at UBC began so that we can do this right and offer a course that meets the needs of UBC and Haida communities concurrently. And our plan as we move this course ahead, piloting beginning this fall, is to partner with additional nations to enrich the living curriculum. So it begins to reflect broader shared needs and interests with an increasing number of nations who regularly or wish to partner with UBC researchers. And we've hired a team of students and community members to lead conversations, to survey and interview partners and participants so they can identify gaps and interests. And we are working collectively now towards addressing those as we build our syllabus and get ourselves ready for an exciting fall ahead. 
Starting next January, I will also be offering a new interdisciplinary undergraduate seminar course on Indigenous knowledge and the environment. And this is a course I had the privilege to design and lead during my PhD. And I'm so excited to bring this into the BC context so students can engage in these conversations at earlier stages in their careers at UBC. Of course, I'm also a massive advocate of engaging even younger minds through Riparia and our NISCA eco-science camps, where we actively discuss and practice learning from multiple ways of knowing, engaging science and art in tandem with language and story and creating space in their minds for this way of thinking from even younger stages. And I look incredibly forward to broadening these outreach initiatives to include partners and community members from across the various projects I and we are undertaking in the Center for Indigenous Fisheries. At our center, we're committed to research, teaching, and outreach that places community needs and interests at the heart of all that we do, that, imp that implements reciprocity and Indigenous fishing ethics as methodologies, which I sincerely hope that I've made clear today. Our work ultimately aims to support the management and protection of culturally significant fish and fisheries in ways that uphold and respect Indigenous rights, values, practices, and knowledge systems. And we hope to become a hub nationally and eventually internationally for Indigenous fisheries work, learning, knowledge sharing with our growing network of Indigenous organizations, fishers and managers, thinkers, artists, advocates, elders, youth, governments, and communities across British Columbia and beyond. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all for your time and attention today. And I'd like to send out a special thanks to graphic illustrator Nicole Marie Burton, who created all of the comic style illustrations shared in this presentation today, without which uh, I wouldn't be able to communicate many of these ideas uh, as effectively. So Toyax, Nicole, and happy to, to shift into some time for discussion if there's still time for that. Thanks. <laughs>